It's a great pleasure to be here with you this morning and can I begin first of all with a word of thanks to everybody who I know has put a tremendous amount of effort into ensuring first that we were able to complete the legislative journey on the uh, the, the, the creation of the legislative framework around health and social care integration and it was by no means a, an, an easy task in all the work that was involved in that process. But then to also follow it by translating that legislative activity into the practical reality which is, insist which is inherent in creating the partnerships in all local authority areas and ensuring that they are able to, to function and to make the impression on people's lives that we uh, we hope them to make and I, I, I don't underestimate the scale of the effort that's been put in by a whole range of our different partners um, in that process and I thank everybody very warmly in that process. I think we've got to be pretty clear at the outset of this conversation today that this is, this is what I think we would call mega reform. Uh, this is an absolutely central transformative element of the reform agenda in Scotland today and for many years in our society because the issues that have been wrestled with here at the heart of the debate about how best to support individuals with vulnerabilities in our society and to ensure that they have the most effective care and support arrangements in place is not a new debate and the challenges that we've wrestled with have, uh, are in no way new because the issues that are at the heart of much of the integration agenda have been the subject of much dialogue and debate uh, over many years in advance of this legislative moment to take action in this respect. But the necessity of ensuring that this mega reform is successful is enormous. Why? Well, because it affects many, many individuals the length and breadth of our country. And it is vital for the sake of those individuals and for ensuring that we support them to the greatest of our ability that the reforms that we undertake in this process are supremely successful. And that responsibility will rest on the shoulders of thousands and thousands of public, and public servants around the country who work for a whole range of different organisations. But what unites them, what brings them together is the fact that all of them, regardless of the organisations for whom they work, are focused on supporting the needs of some of the most vulnerable individuals in our society. So out of that great organisational plethora that exists within Scotland today, there is the unifying purpose of ensuring that we get the reforms correct so that we properly support individuals and we give them the most effective care journey we possibly can do um, as we meet their needs within our society. So it's important for the sake of the individuals who will be the individuals to whom these public services are directed and these public services must support. It is also essential for the sustainability of our public services and our public finances in the current context. I don't need to rehearse to anybody in this room the challenges of our public finances and the challenges that will be lying ahead for us in the next number of years. But out of that challenge, comes the necessity for us to deliver effectively for the individuals of whom I spoke a moment ago. The vulnerable individuals in our society who, even in their, their, their 90s and once they're 100, are still um, absolutely direct in all that they've got to say and their appreciation of the challenges and the pressures around them, but they're still entitled to decent, quality, effective public service support despite the financial challenges with which we all wrestle. So the challenge for us is to find a way within the available resources that we have. And there are still, despite the reductions in public expenditure, many, many resources available to us. How we can stretch those resources to meet the needs of individuals. And this reform agenda, the integration agenda, gives us an essential tool in that process. I was struck a number of years ago by a senior health official who once said to me that um, he, had, uh, he was increasingly encouraging those around him to focus not on the 3% that was the challenge of the efficiency saving, but to ensure that the 97% that was still there was able to make the more decisive impact as a consequence of its, uh, of its deployment in a more effective way than we were to date. And we should, I think, dwell on that point as we think through how we take forward this 
transformative reform agenda, which is so essential to guaranteeing the sustainability of our public services and our care services in the years to come. For me, that agenda will depend on, on three essential ingredients, on partnership, on leadership and engagement. On partnership, um, those of you who have had to listen to me on public platforms over the last eight years will have heard me say that nothing, absolutely nothing, is sorted in my experience in one neat little compartment. It involves a whole plethora of different organisations and skills and specialisms to make sure that we find the solutions that are necessary for individuals in our society. So the fact that we have here today uh, a gathering of our partners from, from the Scottish Government, from the Health Service, from our local authority partners, from our third sector partners, is an essential recognition that none of us will be achieved if we work in any spirit other than partnership. And partnership essentially rises and falls for me on, on how people get on with each other. Um, and if we can get past the organisational boundaries and the organisational obstacles of, um, you know, we do it on yellow paper or we do it on pink paper, um, we'll make a lot of progress. And if we can build personal relationships and, uh, to, to encourage this process of reform, then it'll go a long way uh, to uh, defeating the organisational manuals of the management consultants um, in, in the process. So I, I, I encourage that. Um, very clear partnership working that uh, has got us to where we are today and which will be essential to the success of all of these ventures. Secondly, on leadership, there are, um, I don't want in any way to kind of um, suggest that the 32 individuals that will be leading these um, partnerships around the country uh, are the most critical public servants in Scotland for the next few years, but um, you are the most critical public servants in Scotland for the next few years, in my humble opinion. So if anyone's <laughs> If anyone's taken fright, um, it's too late, I'm afraid. Um, they, and it, it is crucial that the, that the partnerships are led, uh, not just by these 32 critical individuals around the country, but by those who support them, by an environment of mutual support, that there is a willingness to uh, support these 32 individuals around the country and the partnerships that work around about them, because it will... Uh, they will be critical to the success of the reform agenda that we take forward and I think the individuals who are, are in those roles uh, have got significant responsibilities but they've also got significant opportunities to for once in a lifetime shape the way in which we effectively deliver integrated care for some of the most vulnerable citizens in our country. And the third one, third point for me is engagement. We have to, there was a fabulous example there of how we engaged um, uh, residents of the, uh, the, the care home in South Lanarkshire and got the best out of their involvement in that process. And that's a beautiful example of, of all of that. But let me give you a not so good example. Um, when I walked into the halls of Broxburn, I know it's a completely different sector, but I'll use it nonetheless. Um, when I walked into the halls of Broxburn factory, its a demise having been announced by its owners of Ion, I was talking to one employee on the shop floor and he said to me, you know, I was saying, you know, what, you know, how are you feeling about this? How do you think things have gone? You know, what's been the problem? And this guy said to me, he said, well, let me put it to you like this, Mr. Swinney. If I'm standing around doing nothing for 36% of my working day and nobody gives a moment's thought to that fact, is it any wonder this factory is shutting? So there you are. There's a man in a sausage line in, in Halls of Broxburn doing nothing for 36% of his day and nobody bothered. Nobody cared. Nobody was interested in the fact that this was happening and then, you know, 1,600 people lost their jobs. We, th there is a necessity for us to capture the involvement, the awareness, the perspective, the real-life experience of people involved at the coalface of delivering these services. I was up in uh, Highland in uh, visiting some of the staff who've been involved in the integration agenda there. And one of the public servants said to me that the best thing she felt about the choices that had been made about the integrated model, uh, and she was a local authority member of staff who was now working for the health board, uh, or the health, the, the, the health board led services, and um, I can never remember which way around it is for uh, children or older people. And this lady said to me the best thing about it was that she didn't live with the, the constant fear 
of being bollocked for committing local authority money to spend on a, local, on a health board priority. So she'd been liberated from that worry that she was somehow going to be under pressure because you've signed up to spending local authority money on something that a health board should be providing. Now, if we could eliminate one curse in Scottish public policy, that's the curse I want you to eliminate. To encourage and engage staff to think, well, regardless of who's putting up the money, how can we do this differently and better for the needs of individuals? And think together, collectively, in partnership, in an engaged climate, about what we can do to shape that reform agenda. So, for me, this will rise or fall, <coughs> not on the marvellous, beautiful, elegant legislation that Parliament has provided for you. And it's always, always beautiful, that legislation that comes out of Parliament. It will rise or fall on partnership, leadership and engagement. What are my hopes? Well, my hopes are twofold. My hopes are that out of this agenda, we are able to say to ourselves in five years' time, Scotland has a truly person-centred approach to the delivery of care in our country for every single individual. Different for this one versus that one, but enabling elderly ladies and elderly men to sit in our facilities around the country and feel comfortable that they are well supported and more importantly, probably even more importantly, they can sit in their own homes, the homes that brought their families up that they love, the homes that have been their lives and be supported to have a good quality of life. If we can in five years time say that Scotland is a person-centred care country, this will be a triumph. And the other thing is if we can, so my other priority, is that if we can look at the quality of care that we all together provide for some of the most vulnerable individuals in our society, whether they are elderly people, whether they are young people with challenges, whether they are people with disabilities, whether they are people who just find the world a bit difficult to work their way through, whether they are people who are offenders, who have become offenders, not because they've got a predisposition, predisposition to become an offender, but because they've had some terrible incident that we've not managed to properly care for them and support them through. That, for me, will be another triumph. So in five years' time, um, who knows, I might still be a minister in the government in five years' time, who knows, but you'll all still be here to, <laughs> to judge it all. Let's make sure that Scotland is a person-centred country in the delivery of care and let's make sure that every one of our citizens sees an improvement in the care that we are able to deliver and support to them to meet their needs in our society. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for that, uh, Mr Swinney. I think something that quite often people in government need reminded about is that in addition to ministers being ministers, they're also constituency members of parliament and engaging week in, week out with people for whom these are very real issues. And I know that in discussions with Mr Swinney over the years, he's brought that experience very powerfully to bear and, and we heard some of that now. There'll be an opportunity for some questions uh, and answers in a couple of moments, but firstly, we're going to see another film that will bring some voices into the room to remind us why we're doing this. Integration has to be fundamentally about empowering individuals and communities. We just can't go on the same as we have. Um, we have to do things differently. It's about allowing individuals more choice, more control, so that they can take control over their lives, that they can live independently, and take a full part in their local community. In my life before, I was drinking a lot. People were taking advantage of me, like stealing my money and cigarettes and everything. But when I moved to leaving, with the ARB stepping in, I feel safer, I don't drink as much. And like, I just feel better. Following an admission to the ARB Deaner Service, having completed an holistic assessment, that's every aspect of somebody's activities of daily living. And in Craig's case, we had to pull in social work and support staff from the Richmond Fellowship for Tenancy Support and home, Fife Council Home Care Services. But all of these individual agencies had their own part to play in the package of care. It's our role as a case management service to really oversee that the services are running efficiently together, working collaboratively together 
And most of the time we do that through the Fife multi-agency care programme approach. So we would have regular CPA meetings. Craig would also be invited along to that because he's very much a part of making the decisions about what care and treatment he thought he needed. So we would all meet regularly. It could be quarterly or six-weekly and review what was going well and what wasn't going so well. It has to be recognised that our staff have a key role to play. Um, they have to be actively engaged in the design, development and the delivery of local services and new ways of working. Change on this scale and of this complexity uh, means that we simply can't start from structures. We have to start with people and I've often found that many of our frontline staff have a key role to play when it comes to breaking down organisational silos and promoting a blending of services between agencies and across sectors. This integration agenda provides us with a fantastic opportunity to encourage staff to inform the detail of what needs to happen at local level. The ARBD team, their one side, and the Richmond Fellowship, they must support workers, they talk to each other, so if there's a problem, they work it out together. That helps me. And if I've got a problem, I talk to them both, both groups. Having the opportunity to work with Craig has been a pleasure and um, to see people's life progress from where Craig started to where he is now, just to know that we've been involved and supporting him to get to where he is. It's what I come to my work for in the morning, um, building all these relationships with other people. It helps us in the future, it helps Craig in the future, um, helps hopefully other people that are in Craig's situation. Right, the benefits of all the organisations working together are great because there's a consistency now in the approach to Craig's care. He could pick up the phone and phone any of us and somebody will be there to help him. So he's never on his own or isolated. The benefits for Craig, for all the teams to be working together, all the services to be joined up, it gives Craig consistency, continuity of care, reassurance. You felt safe and supported. We as a service feel safe and supported too because we all work together to deliver the best outcomes. Well, I believe if integration is going to work, and I really do believe it will work, then a rich tapestry of services has to emerge at a local level. I think if you're looking at enhancing the, um, the quality of our services and the range of choice that's available, then services such as the alcohol-related brain damage service um, is a really good example of innovation which needs to be mainstreamed and it needs to be grown in ways which are scalable, transferable and repeatable. I think as Craig's circumstances have shown us, the lives of those who depend on our services are not straightforward and are not played according to one script. And what was really um, important in terms of having a real impact on his life was all the different agencies across sectors all getting together, providing a holistic approach to his need and really making that difference. Understanding need, listening to feedback and harnessing the skills of service users and carers will be vital if service innovation is going to flourish. In Fife, we've had a very strong tradition of listening to what the public have to say about our services. Very recently, we had a very successful event called Moving Forward. And there we had over 100 representatives from a wide range of groups that wanted to discuss, reflect and begin to shape the future of public participation in Fife. What surprised me was just the level of engagement um, and how strong the feeling was that people needed to be heard. And what is very clear is that the whole sense of a civic voice will be important in the shaping of future services. Uh, again, I thought some really profound things to reflect on there. I like the notion that our lives are not all paid, played according to one script. Um, obvious when you see it, but not always when you look at the way that our organisations have performed in the past. I'm going to invite John Swinney to come back up to the uh, platform here. And uh, I'm sure there will be many questions in the room. Can I have a first question, please? Miles Mack, I'm here as the Chair of the Royal College of General Practitioners. Obviously, General Practice has got a key role in the integration debate. I'm just wondering if there's any concern about the workforce issues that General Practice is suffering just now with widespread vacancies in practices um, and how we can tackle that to make sure that we're in a position to support integration. I think, Miles, it's, it's absolutely the, the role of general practitioners uh, are, are fundamental to this process. Uh, I think if we, in looking at the, um, the efficiency of the operation of the service and the necessity of meeting the needs of individuals as they progress through that service, general practitioners will be key players in either the 
um, the journey of somebody into a more acute setting and the journey out of a more acute setting. So the role of general practitioners uh, are absolutely fundamental. The necessity of ensuring that the general practitioner service is uh, well supported uh, and that we don't have the recruitment challenges that uh, you know, I'm familiar with within the, the service um, is an issue that my colleagues and, uh, are, are actively working to support and some of the recent decisions that we've made in relation to financial support for general practice have been designed to try to address those, uh, those factors. Um, although uh, I think the, 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 there will be difficulties and implications if we don't properly and effectively resolve those challenges uh, because the, the, the role of general practitioners will be significant in how we support individuals through that journey. I think there's also a very important role for um, GPs in recognising that they have to be part of the reform atmosphere as well, that there is a need for GPs to be involved in uh, the forming of some of the attitudes, not, not the, the forming of the, the processes and approaches that are taking place in the local. It can't be, we can't have these conversations and then turn up to the GPs and say, here's the model we've beautifully designed for you. It's, that's just not going to work. So we need to make sure that GPs are actively involved in, uh, in that process of forming the thinking around how th these models are, are, are designed and deployed at local level. And if we get that, because the primary care service is just so comprehensive in all localities within Scotland, it strikes me that that, you know, that is going to be critical, the involvement of primary care is going to be critical in how we um, successfully design these models. So I think my two observations would be, um, Firstly, that we need to act to ensure that the, the, the profession is properly supported, that we don't have gaps in the provision of the profession and, and gaps in capacity. And secondly, that um, we have a very close involvement of GPs in the formulation of the partnership agendas at local level, and that, I think, will stand us in good stead. Uh, Ron Geekham, leader of Eastern Barger Council. I'm very encouraged by, by the slide you have in front of us which talks about delivering better outcomes because that's absolutely what we, we all want to do. We want to be sure that's what this is about, this integration. I think one of the worries we perhaps have though is that it would be seen as any cost-cutting exercise because I think the challenge for health and for local government, as you know just now, is very much in that sector. And we, I think there is a worry that perhaps that will be the, the outcome that uh, perhaps some will see, rather than actually making things better for the people that we actually are trying to support. So I would like some reassurance that uh, we're not going to see that put in at any point in the future. The, the, there's a, the, there's, a, there's a, a very fine line to be walked here, Rhonda, in this whole debate, because, you know, there's a finite, finite, there's going to be a finite sum of money available in all circumstances. Even if it was 20% more than what we've got currently available, it would still be a finite sum of money. The challenge that um, I would like public servants to think about is how can we use the resources that we have available to us to deliver better outcomes? And we all know that there will be ways in which we can deliver better outcomes for individuals and we can save money. I, I don't subscribe to the view that you only get a better outcome if you spend more money. I can't possibly believe that as a finance minister. It would be, I'd be struck out of the gathering of finance ministers of the world if I believed anything else. But it is true. We, and, and there are numerous examples around the country where by earlier intervention, by the spending of, let's say, a thousand pounds on a mental health intervention, we can save ourselves £45,000 of other cost, most likely in incarceration. Now, but the problem for that is that the £45,000 comes out of the Scottish Prison Service budget and the £1,000 comes out of the NHS budget. And the challenge for us as a whole public sector is to think about how we can focus and I think the way we can do this is by focusing on the needs of the individual. 
what does that individual in front of me require? And if they require the £1,000 mental health intervention at this moment, before it all gets out of control, then that's what we should do. And we've got to find a way within the resources available to us to make that happen by having that focus on the needs of the individual. Now, out of this process of, you know, I, I was quite, I think, quite open about it in what I said, um, we are going to face financial challenges. We'll face financial challenges from two things. One, from the uh, availability of public finances, and secondly, from the changing demography of our country. So we're going to have more people who will be needing more interventions. So even if the money was growing, the number of people needing interventions would be growing as well. So there will be a need for us to make the money in whatever scenario, whether it's about public funding cuts or whether it's about um, changing demography and rising demand, we're going to have to make the money go further. That's the challenge for us. And I think the, 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 the key issue, and I know how difficult it is to reconfigure services to, without causing a storm of public anxiety. The way to do it is to try to win the argument successfully with members of the public locally that what we're actually doing is improving the service and the facility. Let me give you an example. In, in my own community, um, in the town of Blairgowrie, the dementia service was provided in a fantastic cottage hospital in the town. And the feedback from members of the service, and you know, what it was basically, it was a, you know, people came in there and they were assessed for a fortnight to test their, you know, their exposure to dementia. Um, of itself, quite a confusing thing for somebody who might be at risk of dementia. And the feedback was, we should be deploying this in the community. So the community, the, the, the health board engaged in a discussion with the local community, advocated by the nursing staff about why this would actually be better. And before we knew it, we were able to, there was a, a momentum created that made the argument, not one about, we're going to have a hospital here that's going to lose one half of its purpose, but we're actually going to have members of the public supported in their own homes by staff trying to assist them <coughs> in tackling dementia. Now, what that example, why I use that example is to say that it is possible for us to reconfigure public services in a way that wins the argument locally, but we've got to invest a lot of time and care in making sure we do that properly. And that's, I don't suggest it's a tea party, I don't suggest it for a moment, but I do suggest it can be done. And in amongst all of this, um, the challenges of the availability of public finances and the a necessity to address the fact that we have a growing number of people in our society who will need some degree of intervention. We have to try to provide that with two things in mind. How can we deliver better outcomes out of that and how can we deliver that in an environment of fiscal sustainability?